Army. Correct. Okay. Just uh, let me let me ask you first uh, a little background. Like, where were you born, for instance? I was born in Illinois, but grew up in Pennsylvania. I see. And how did you get to Colorado? Well, I, after uh, I went to college in Philadelphia, and then I. I just always wanted to go west, and so I just came out to Boulder to go to college for, for law school. Oh, and you, and you went to uh, CU Law? Right. Good for you, okay. And uh, how, what happened to you as a younger person and going into service and all that sort of thing? What? Well, well, I, I grew up in, it's kind of a rural community in Pennsylvania, and uh, I graduated in 1942. But I was 17, so I had to wait a few months to get into service. So I went in, actually went into service in 1943, in uh, March, I think, of 43. And, and when you went into service, uh, did your parents have to okay your... Uh... No, no, I was 18. You was 18, so yeah. you didn't have to do that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, because a lot of guys I talked to, their parents had to okay them uh, going in at 17 and stuff yeah. like that, you know, which they did. You know, mm -hmm. that's, yeah, I uh, guess they were some. Uh, yeah. So, uh, what did you, when did you enter the service? Did, uh, in, in, 19, yeah, in, in 19, March of 43, and then I uh, went from induction center in Pennsylvania down to uh, Camp Lee, Virginia, which I was in the quartermaster, for quartermaster basic training. Okay. And that's where I took my basic training there. And were you a buck private then? Or? Oh yes, oh yes. I remained that. I, mean, I had, at various at times I was a, what they call an acting NCO, but I didn't get the stripes or anything like that. I just... Yeah. So, <clears throat> so, you, uh, and so you entered the service and then what happened to you? What, well, I went tell to, us what happened. I went to, uh, well, to Camp Lee, Virginia. After finishing basic, I had apparently uh, uh, adequate scores on some testing that, that were done. So I had a choice to either, uh, well, I could continue in the quartermaster, but I also was had the opportunity to go to officer training school or the Army uh, Air Corps, which is part of the, the Air Corps was part of the Army at that time. and. Uh, the other option was to go to ASTP, which was an Army training program. I mean, and that was supposedly you went to college to study engineering with the idea that you'd then become a combat engineer. And so I thought, well, going to college, that's what I wanted to do. So I took that option. And from Camp Lee, Virginia, I went to Washington, D.C., to Georgetown University, started there, they gave me some initial background gaps in my training in my, my high school. Rural school didn't, have me, didn't give me very many uh, adequate background for engineering. So I went to Georgetown for some pickup work. Then I went to Catholic University, which is also in Washington, D.C., for some additional work. And then for whatever reason, the Army, I guess, decided that they needed bodies worse uh, over there in, in Europe than they did in Washington, D.C., so they closed up the programs all over the country and sent everybody to various other, uh, other uh, divisions, etc. I wound up in going to what was called the 102nd Infantry Division in uh, Camp Swift, Texas, for infantry training. I guess was still, that division was just, uh, had been in, some of the older people there had been in training for some time, but they needed additional bodies to bring it up to whatever standard. I think it's, the division is supposed to have about 15,000 15, bodies in it. And so we needed, they needed people to fill that limit, whatever it was. So I had a few months of basic training in infantry in uh, Texas, and that was it. And then they, were, they sent us to uh, New Jersey to be shipped overseas. And from there we went on, on uh, well, what they call it, the, 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 uh, I forgot the name, it was on a, a number of ships, and what do you call that when you, uh, uh, it was on a Liberty ship, and what do they call that, um, 
uh, convoy. In convoy. Oh, convoy. Okay. Yeah, and so we're uh, on convoy, which means you zigzag all over the place, I guess, because of the submarine activities. It took longer to go that way. We went to Normandy. Of course, at that time, uh, Normandy was already secured. I mean, this this was in well, probably oh I don't know it was in late summer, and uh, the uh, June was when you know, D Day took place. So when we got there, it was already secure. There was no activity on. We didn't have any problem landing at all. So we went over, but you did have to get off on those cargo nets and so forth on the landing craft, etc. But uh, there was no activity, you know, we didn't run into any opposition at all, so we didn't have any problem like the guys who were there earlier. So, so you, you landed on Normandy, yeah. but then you went on, on in? Uh, yeah, and from Normandy, uh, there was a little, uh, little delay action, you know, going on, but not, not, nothing much. And then we, uh, the Germans were retreating pretty fast at that point, so we were just basically trying to get up with the front line troops, you know. And so we went through Normandy, and then through Belgium and Holland, and right into the very western part of, of Germany, all without any opposition, without any. You now the, the traveling was a little, uh, we did a lot of walking with some trucking. And one of the interesting things was we did. Okay, so uh, so you got to Germany. Your division got to Germany, right? And with uh, very little uh, encouragement. Not, not huh? much activity, combat activity, on the way out. That to Germany, no. Yeah. Very little, and uh, so we got to Germany, and, we, and the traveling. One of the interesting aspects of some of the travel was that we were. Uh, trying to catch up with the Germans, and they, we, we, I guess they found a train, an old train, and uh, we were in the old, remember the old, in the First World War, they called them 40 and 8s? Yeah, right. And we had a uh, box car, at for, and we had a train, of course, but anyhow, the uh, plumbing facilities were a hole in the, in the, in the floor of the box car. And of course, we were going so slow, it didn't make much difference. You could get off to take care of necessities. But anyhow, but there, that was an interesting aspect of it. The old 40 and 8s were still around. Still going. Yeah, still going, yeah. So we, we caught up with the Germans, and we were assigned to the uh, British 9th Army, which is, was in Germany and Holland, and across, oh, across the north end of the whole line of activity. And uh, one of the things that happened there, we were, we dug in and we were told that no, the Germans were not too far off, keep it quiet, don't make any racket, don't they? And some uh, Scotsman with his bagpipes started marching up and down behind us, so, and we thought we were supposed to be quiet, and this guy's up there blowing this bagpipe, <laughs> like, like, a, and I guess supposedly that's one of their things, you know, they, they supposedly do that before they go into combat, it's supposed to scare the enemy, I guess. And uh, maybe it does things for their spirits too, I don't know. Didn't do much for us. We thought we might <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, shoot a hole in his bagpipe or something to keep him quiet, but thought that wouldn't be too smart. So anyhow, but it, it, that was uh, an oddity. I thought, well, it's something that goes back a long time, I guess, in their history, but not in ours. No. And uh, so anyhow, we um, from there, uh, we did go uh, kept going just forward. The Germans were still pulling back and and uh, there was a little combat going on, but not a whole lot. And we were going through little towns, we actually went through numbers of little towns, uh, German towns, and the only problem we had was with snipers, you know, they were, we, you know, the way we went through the towns, we lined up on each side of the street and we kind of watch across the street for the other guys. See anything at all? You shot. You didn't. You didn't ask a question. Yeah, just, right. Now, yeah. what were you? Were you carrying a rifle or? A yeah. Now I was. I, I was a rifleman, and one of the things that uh, I had was a, for additional equipment. Was I was I had a, what's called a grenade launcher, for my rifle, and I and I never fired the darn thing, but it was a little dealy that fit on the end of your your rifle, and you 
had special shells that didn't have a uh, the bullet on the end of it, just a, just a shell without the bullet. And this was used to, and you'd, you'd fit these, uh, what your, your, well you had both the uh, personnel grenade and you also had an armor, you're supposed to be armor person grenade. And so I had those and I, you throw, I threw away my gas mask and then just used that to hold grenades. And so I had a bunch of grenades that I carried with me. And I never fired that uh, launcher, but I had to carry the grenades and so forth yeah. with me. And, uh, but I, I did use other, other hand grenades. I did use those quite yeah. often. And, uh, and we were, you know, So what would you do? Come to a building and fit well, some grenades in it? Well, it's suspicious. You, you thought, you, it, it, rather than going in first, you throw a grenade in first and yeah. then go in. And so, and then also going through some of these towns, we did, you know, have to go into some of the buildings, you know, that, along the way. And of course that gave us a little opportunity to do a little looting along the way too, was when we went into the buildings. And an experience, one experience along the way too was that uh, I, was into one, I went into one house, was down in the basement, I started out of the basement, it was kind of a little landing, you go up a few steps to a landing, and then the kitchen apparently was up on a few more steps off to one side. And uh, along the, on this landing, there was a bunch of canned goods all stacked up in this nice shelving. And so I, I started to reach for some of that. This lady, an older lady, uh, grandmother type, opened the door of the kitchen above me and, and waved a broom at me. <laughs> and, I, and I, and it's a good thing I was reaching because, you know, when, he, when he, you, you're kind of nervous, you know, in, a, in that situation. I could have shot her if I had my weapon in, in a position to do it, but then in this case I was reaching for her, her whatever it was, the yeah, canvas. Yeah, get her canvas. So I, she just, she, you know, she scared me a little bit. But anyhow, I thought, well, I better just leave her alone. If she's got a broom, I'll just get out of there. So, <laughs> but anyhow, that, uh, but that was one of the things that I thought was kind of, Amusing. She wouldn't let you yank, stick, or uh, no, chow. Well, and anyhow, I, you know, probably they didn't have much to eat. I mean, they were probably, you know, they probably didn't have hardly anything because at this point, the Germans were vacating the area, and, and unless they had something on their own to eat, I don't think anybody's going to provide food for them. So yeah. it's probably really important to her. Yeah. Anyhow, I thought I'd just leave her alone when she's too mean. You cook with a broom too. So, anyhow, I, uh, and then I don't know from from then on we, we kept going for a short distance and where I, I maybe might be interested where where I was wounded we were going through a ca cabbage patch a big field of cabbages and we found some German fox holes there we thought well this is a, these are pretty good and these are a whole lot nicer than what we would dig for ourselves so uh, we thought well this is a good place to just stop. But in any case, we started. We went on a little further just to kind of make sure was, everything was safe enough. And I must have tripped something. I mean, it was a booby trap or something. But I, I saw a little grenade down to my side, and I thought, you know, somebody throw it or did I trip it or what? And anyhow, I, I grabbed it and I, and I didn't know it was active at that point. Then I smelled it and I knew it was it was active. So I threw it and I just as I got out of my fingers, it uh, went off. Wow. So that's how I got wounded this was, was this grenade that, and uh, it knocked me out. And, uh, and, I, and when I came to, the medics were there already. That's really, they came up real fast. And so the medics were there, and I thought, well, I'd broken my rib. I felt I, could felt I had something in my rib. I said, well, just you know, take me up. I'm okay. Just keep it. I'll be all right. And uh, by that time, there were... Uh, they gave me a shot or something or other, and I was out. I don't remember anything. Clunk, yeah. 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 So I was out, and the next time I, when I woke up, I was in the field hospital in the Maastricht Holland, and which is a, it was an old school building, it was an old school building that converted into a hospital. And so I wound up there. And they did emergency surgery there. And. Um, What'd you have to have done, you know? Well, there's a number I had. Uh, well, they did a laparotomy, well, you know, to clean, to make sure nothing in metal in some of my vital organs. And then they, uh, they, and I had 
23 operation scars for you know, just pieces of shrapnel that they removed, including this one up here, and just close to my eye, but not. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so, the, uh, but in any case, uh, I apparently died on the operating table because the, the, uh, the, one of the doctors came by later and told me, he said, don't ever let them use sodium pentothal on you again because you had a, a real bad reaction to it. And so, uh, so that I always made you no know, whatever. And I guess they used sodium pentothal, it's not used anymore for, for that kind of uh, thing. Not, you know, uh, that those pentothals are used for induction, but I don't think they use them for induction anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, they don't, so yeah, that's probably right. That's so I had that reaction then. And anyhow, I, I mean, I did have the near death. I can I remember the floating and going down, you know, and so forth. They're typical as what I what you normally hear, and, and it was pretty much the same. And then I, I woke up in in a ward where the and um, and I heard bells, and it turns out, you know, I thought that's all well, part of this <laughs> process, I guess. But I, and uh, when I woke up, it was a nurse with her with those metal dealies that they can they carry their instruments in, their scissors. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, it was clanking, you know, and I thought that was bells. I mean, the, so it's just like, <laughs> Instruments on a yeah, tray, yeah. yeah. And so, in any case, that, that I, uh, and from, from uh, Master Colin, then I was taken by ambulance to Liège, Belgium. And in, in Liège, it was a tent hospital. It was kind of interesting, a tent hospital and at that time, the Germans were sending over what they call the buzz bombs. Yeah. And uh, they, they, they characterized, you know, the, you, hit, you hit this putt, putt, putt. And that, was, that meant that they were still going. And when that putt, putt stopped, you know, it was, you know, you better look for something to hide under. And uh, it was, uh, while I was in the hospital there, the, uh, there was some, a buzz bomb came across and Apparently, in this same tent where I was, the big tent, there were some children in there that, uh, that must have been injured in one, somewhere or another, maybe through buzz bombs, I don't know. But uh, the nurses, when that, when that came over, the kids were, got a little hysterical. So the nurses went over to them. <clears throat> and I thought, you know, if you could, you better get under something. But, you know, the, the nurses were just, I mean, they just, I went over there and just stayed with those children while well, the let putt putt went on past and then it was all over and then everything just picked up and resumed again like it was. But uh, but the, and that was kind of interesting that the nurses were so concerned about the children. That, you know, and their, was that an army hospital? Yeah, it was uh -huh. an army hospital and they had some children in there. I don't know why exactly, I, I don't know. They must have picked them up somewhere. Or yeah, they must have been someplace where close by was yeah. something. They were injured, <clears throat> but anyhow, that was uh, so. That uh, then I went from Liège to Paris, and then they flew me from Paris over to England for additional work, and that's where I uh, stayed for a while in, in England while they did this, some cleanup work, I guess. And then after that, what happened to you? Well, after after that, uh, well, I went back to. To France again, and I, and I supposedly was going to be going back to active service again. I mean, um, they must have thought I was well enough. So, but in any case, while I was there, uh, VE day. Oh, you got back on VE day. day. Yeah. So I good was day there. to get back. Or yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I was just outside of Paris and for, went on VE day, and so that was quite a celebration there. For yeah. Me. So. Then I went back to England to be to ship back to the states. Separated to the states. Huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So what was the best rank you ever got was a PFC, huh? Right. Um, but you I, were a you were a rifle toting guy in the front lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You sure true. as hell were. Yeah. So, wow. But uh, so as far as rank, I never got. Uh, I would, uh, for a while I was assigned to some activities. In well, in, in England, if I got back, which would have uh, they called me a uh, acting NCO, which uh, didn't give me any stripes, but they the 
and, and normally if you've been in a situation where you know you're going to be a permanent cadre person you might have gotten some stress yeah. but I was uh, just temporary assignment so <laughs> so uh, okay what then you then you uh, you were back in uh, Paris, VE day, and then back to England, and then back to the States. Is that what happened? Pretty Did you come back on a troop ship or something like that? Yeah, I came back on another um, big cargo ship. ship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, How many guys would you guess were on that ship? I don't know, but this uh, one of the things that going coming back, we had a very bad experience in that we hit a, what they call a, a nor'wester or whatever it is, they, there's a term for it. Bad, bad weather, and uh, and I, I I didn't get seasick because I, I apparently that's not one of the things that I, I must be okay. But in any case, because I wasn't seasick, they put me on kitchen duty, and <laughs> uh, and you know and you look out there and those, those guys that are trying to eat there's on benches, and and you you know the ship was going every direction, and uh, it, it would. Um, you, you couldn't hold on to your food and your seat at the same time, so you just, <laughs> I mean, that you wouldn't have to, yeah. to eat hardly, but anyhow, they were, uh, and I was sitting, you know, I was in the kitchen and, you know, and kind of watching those pots, you know, I mean, you were watching, and they're <laughs> clamped on the stove, but they, they were slushing around, and, but they did have what's uh, a kind of a passageway up onto the deck, which you could go up and, and, you know, get a little air, so they, which, you know, the other guys couldn't, but so I had this. But I'd go up there and look out, and uh, <laughs> I had never been around the ocean very much. But in any case, you, you went, the ship was uh, down on a trough. You'd see the waves up, uh, way up high, you know. And then you'd go up on the trough, and you're, and the props, the, the back props out. are out of the water. Yeah. You know, they were spinning, and, and then you come back down and slam, you know. And of course, they <laughs> rock for a while. And I guess those old Liberty ships must have been built pretty good because it held together, right? I stuck with it. Huh? Yeah. But there were so many of the guys were sick, it just was a, you know, it wasn't very pleasant. Oh, to yeah. Yeah. No, that's too bad. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so you got back to, you got back to the States eventually. Where'd you disembark, you know? In New Jersey someplace, maybe it's New York, I'm not sure. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> then I went to uh, Philadelphia for I guess they finally do your final discharge, and I was, and they do give you physicals, and, and I was, I got a 50% 50, 50 disability rating. Did you? Going out. Yeah, and I was just, I thought here, they rate you 50% disability, and I was going back to the, the front lines of, if they let the military, yeah. you know, I thought, well, whatever, and uh, but anyhow, I got a 50% disability, and, and then I started going to college to, uh, Temple University at that time. And uh, well, so one of the things, did you get a GI Bill in? Was there a GI Bill in? Right, I had a GI Bill. Yeah, in. okay. So I used that for well, college sure. and for law school until yeah. I think it was, a, was a, it had so many months and <clears throat> it ran out while I was in law school, but all through my Underground. Temple University experience. While I was at Temple, uh, I went out for the wrestling team. I thought I needed to get back in physical condition because I, I thought, well, I just needed to do that. So I went out for wrestling in order to get the conditioning that it was required for that. And one day I was coming out of the shower and the coach came by and he looked at me and he says, what happened to you? I said, the hand grenade. He said, I don't, I said, I don't think I can wrestle you anymore. He said, you're allowed to fall apart on me, so. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. Because uh, the scars were pretty obvious then, and there, and there was quite a few of them. So it, anyhow, he thought he thought it might fall apart. So, but I, anyhow, he didn't. I still continued to wrestle. I did letter in wrestling. So good for you! So, wow. Uh, what weight did you wrestle? <laughs> well, see, this is one of the things that always bothered me. Going into service, I, I weighed 120 pounds. 120. 120, and I was five foot seven. And I looked like I was 14, so yeah, I'll uh, bet. And so, <laughs> you know, the, the, when I when I had the choice between going to NC, uh, NCO, I mean, going to for officer training, or the Air Force, I thought, you know, there's no sense me trying to act like I can command command people. I mean, I look like I'm 14, 
And there's no sense to that of it. So that's why I went to college. At least one of the things that motivated me to go to, go to <laughs> college was that I didn't think I could be, you know, make it. You didn't think you were going to give it to them. I don't think anybody paying attention to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, they pay attention to you. We know that. <laughs> uh, well, that's good. So you, so you got out, you went to college, and then you came out to see you to, to uh, law school, huh? Yes. Is that what happened? Yeah, yeah that's pretty much it. What year did you graduate from law school, do you know? In uh, 1952. 52. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then after that, where did you go? Did you come to Sterling in 52? Or did yeah, you? That's right. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, well, there's an interval between getting out of college and then you have to take your bar exam and so forth. Yeah. So you don't know exactly what the results will be. For that. <clears throat> so uh, I, for a while I worked in the oil fields up in Montana. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then uh, then came back here when when I knew that I passed the bar and I joined uh, Vance Austin. I don't know if you ever Oh, I knew Vance really well. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, he was a red hot democrat but he oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so i joined Vance him. ran for senate one time remember that i think so yeah yeah he uh so it was austin and arnold for a short time then he left yeah and, and uh then dick ross joe coin joined me and okay. after Vance left and so it was austin as arnold and ross for a long time yeah well, that's been a good outfit mm -hmm. yeah <clears throat> Well, it's still, uh, still, <laughs> still Arnold. Well, I guess you you say you've retired, uh, kind of. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you're like me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, so uh, you got some. You got two Purple Hearts. Yes, I did. Uh, uh, one of them they gave me in the hospital in England. Uh, they just went down and they had a cart full. Of Purple Hearts, and I just went down the road and passed yeah. them out like, yeah, you know, just because yeah. there, you know, everybody in there obviously had been wounded, so that, or they wouldn't be there. Yeah, of course. So, and um, then I and I got another one, and they, uh, and, and I can't remember exactly how I got the other one. I think it was maybe maybe when I got discharged. I don't remember, but I had two of them, and uh, but I only was wounded at once, and that's why I've always said, you know, I think I. I I don't know why I have the second one because I don't know exactly. I I wasn't wounded twice. I was wounded once, and but anyhow, I. I but you had considerable wounds. Yes, and I I just left all of these medals and things that uh, they were in a uh, just a uh, I put them up on the top shelf at at, uh, at my home and well I lived out there west of town, and they were on the top shelf for years, and then one of the kids got them out and, and framed them, and so that's why, and of course the two of them are there, so they just framed all of them. Yeah. And that's why, that, that this is a, a, a picture of the, of the... Ruth will take a, yeah. a picture of, yeah, where, where is this frame? Is that the house? It's at the house, yeah. Yeah, okay. I could bring it, I just never did. <coughs> you think you could get a picture? Got back to Sterling about 153? 52. 52? Yeah. Or came here in '52. Right. Yeah. Well, that's good. And you were here. You've been. You've really been involved in the community. We know that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I know you've been a Republican chairman. That part I know. Everything yeah. else. You've been a county judge or. A, a, I was a county judge for 27 and a half years. Yeah. Now. That's. That's what I told him today at the hospital. I said I got. I got to. Uh, we're having some lawsuits and stuff. So I said, I got to go interview a judge. They said, what? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's, that's something else. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Well now, uh, well you came back here, and uh, so so when you were in the service, you didn't have a family or anything like that. You weren't... Uh, I wasn't married, no. But, but did you have a family back at, at home? I, oh yes, I had a family. Uh, there's five boys. I mean, five of you boys, yeah. okay. And uh, three of us were in the service. Uh, at, at, actually, four of us eventually, but, uh, but uh, at the same time I was in the service, there's two other brothers that were. One of them was in the Navy in the South Pacific, and another one was up in the Aleutians. Wow. So. How'd they get along? 
they all they all they they come back Survive, fine shape. Huh? Yeah, no problem. Well, that, that's good. We're good. What'd your dad do? He he worked in the steel mills, <coughs> and uh, he <coughs> had uh, and I guess uh, the only occasion I was ever in one of those buildings where he was working, he was so d dusty. I mean, from the, the I think they did what ca the heavy castings they made these castings for trains on, uh, well, and then uh, and then steel castings and then they also eventually started making the the turrets for tanks yeah and uh, the process requires an awful lot of dust and dirt and so forth and I don't know how to even breathe in those buildings because I went into one of them one time just to see what my dad was doing and he had he got my, what they call silicosis, I guess, right, yeah. uh, miners' consumption, well, right. mostly. and so he was he was in very bad shape. But he, because he had so many kids in the service, he went back to work after, uh, you know, and, and after he'd been sick for a while. But he went back to the steel mills, and so I think that probably was what finally caused, you know, caused him, him to die. Yeah, yeah probably had pulmonary failure. Had yeah. Pulmonary failure. Yeah. yeah. Their lungs scar, you know, and they get uh, that fibrosis and stuff. Yeah, was that, yeah it was, it, it was sand, I guess, is what they were yeah. dealing with. Them. Yeah. yeah. Pneumoconiosis. Yeah. So, wait. So you had five, five. Okay. Well, I don't know what else to ask you here exactly. Tell us about your professional life, though, in Sterling. What do you think some of the highlights were besides? Being a judge, uh, which was pretty awesome. So. I I really don't know. I I enjoyed that. I mean, I I thought there was you know, something that's useful and and I and I had occasion. I thought maybe to help a lot of people. Some of them I you know. And well, like the DUIs, I thought maybe uh, some of the people that, uh, that were before me for DUI drunk, you know, driving under influence. Right. Um, that um, they, I, I had the opportunity to offer them a program or put them in jail, you know. Yeah. And so in several, well, a number of instances, in fact, practically all of them, I gave them the opportunity to either take a program or go to jail, period. Right. You know? And most of them would take the program whether they were successful or not. But I had several of them come to me and tell me that, you know, that, that I saved their life because and by forcing them to get into the program and straighten take out. straighten out, to, yeah. you know that they they cleaned up their act, and that I was, you know, they were. On that's their a way tough to deal. Yeah. yeah that's oh, uh, another thing about uh, on the way well, back here, um, I went to Doctor LaForce and yeah. Dick LaForce, where I had sinus trouble, and he was a uh, what I know. I heard those and throat. Yeah, and. Um, so at one time he was talking about something in his office. I made me ask him what, what, where he was in the service, and he said, "Well, he was with the 102nd Infantry." And I said, well, "That's where I was." And um, I said, I, "And I said, uh, were you in Master Column?" And he said, "Oh yeah." He said, "That's that old school building." I said, "Yeah." I, said, I remember. I didn't know going in, but coming out, I knew it was an old school building. And uh, so he said, I asked him, said, "Well, did you?" You kid you, some of this, this silly looking, this bad surgery that I have on my arms and face and legs, did you do any of that? He says, I don't know. He said, they were coming through so fast, I wouldn't have any idea. But anyhow, it, it's a, he was at the same hospital and could have yeah, been involved guys, in my surgery. That's what I understand. You guys may have crossed paths back yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. That's funny <coughs> run into somebody like that. Yeah. Oh, it's like he told that story about capturing the tank. Do you remember? He he was trying to move forward to find these school buildings and stuff for the hospitals, and he and his sergeant were driving. They came around one of these hedgerows, I guess, and here was this 88 millimeter German <laughs> tank with the yeah. and and the guys got out and surrendered to him. So he captured a tank. Yeah, that's what he said. Of course, and he probably was outgunned <laughs> as far as. Those German tanks are superior to ours. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're terrific. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, 
Well, anyway, think of anything else we should tell? No, I don't know. I, you know some of the, in the hospitals, you know, some of the people are in pretty, pretty bad shape, you know. And, and oh, yeah. You know they're going to die. You know, just, you know, because of, well, some of the tankers, you know, when they get, uh, you know, when they get shot in those tanks, you know, they generally cause a fire. Right. So they, they're burnt, you know, to yeah. the point where they can't survive. They can live for a little while, but yeah. they can't survive. Yeah. And so there were some of those around in hospitals. So. so when you said you dug in, did you just actually dig a foxhole and... Yeah, you, did, you, you dug a hole to kind of cover, you know, get, get your body down as far as you can. Yeah. And it's always been confusing to me in, in a sense, you know, supposedly being a Christian, <laughs> you're down here hunkered down and there's, you know, shoot, both shells going, we're shooting, they're shooting, the Germans are shooting back. And you get to recognize whether it's incoming or outgoing, and you know, by the sound. And when it's incoming, you, you know, you, you just get down, you know, because you feel, well, it's going to be here someplace close by. But you get to realize that, you know, and then maybe if you, you, know, you, you, can, you can pray quite a bit because you can hear them coming in pretty close. Because the Germans are on, on the other side, they're supposedly doing the same thing I'm doing. Right. And they're praying just as hard. And, <laughs> and uh, here's, so this, this, this makes no sense to me. It's just so, so silly that you, you were trying to kill each other and, and we're both supposedly Christian nations and people and so forth. Don't make any sense. But yeah, it is. It's kind of bizarre. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. We don't like that. We're still doing it, though. Yeah, we're still doing it. Yeah, that's right. And I don't know, I guess human nature is something that we got. <laughs> I don't know what you can do about it. I don't either. 